We are delighted to have with us Vice President of Ghana, John Dramani Mahama. His Excellency Mahama has been in politics for past 15 years in the parliament and in the government in many capacities, from running the Ministry of Communication to founding the Ghana AIDS Commission. He's in fact at Yale to attend as a participant at the Yale Global Health Leaders Institute Conference. Excellency Mahama, welcome. Thank you. So the question I have for, first of all, is during the conference, you had the opportunity to meet many of the fellow African health officials, as well as other experts. So what are the challenges that Africa faces in terms of disease today? And what are the or plans for dealing with them? Um, actually, health is one area in which Africa faces a lot of challenges and um, a lot of resources have had to be applied, you know, to try and uh, deal with some of the challenges we face. I mean, from malaria to tuberculosis to HIV AIDS to maternal mortality to mental health. I mean, just which, name any sector. Which, which of these are the most important at this point? That is the point. We have determined what we think are the most important and often it creates a concentration on those ones to the neglect of others that creates problems. For instance, I mean, 30 years ago the world discovered HIV AIDS and over the last 30 years a lot of focus has been on HIV AIDS and so huge, huge, huge resources have been put into the fight against HIV AIDS to the neglect of other areas like malaria, like mental health and so on and so forth. And so even though malaria continues to be a major killer, the amount of money and resources that have gone into malaria are nowhere up to uh, one, one twentieth of the amount of money that has gone into HIV and AIDS, even though malaria has been with us much longer. It's only recently that we are upscaling the you know, resources going into these areas. And so I don't like to put one health challenge over the other. I think all health challenges are health challenges and need to be dealt with. And so we should try and distribute resources, you know, fairly across to see how we can deal with a lot of these issues. So I was very happy to come and find that our team working here had been working on mental health. Mental health, for instance, is one area we have ne neglected completely. It is a very stigmatized area. Families don't want to own up to having mad uh, people who have mental challenges in their family and so on and so forth. And so I think it's a whole new way of looking at things. Yeah, talking about stigma, um, the stigma attached to homosexuality yeah. is, is a major problem, I gather, in yeah. Ghana because yeah. you have brought down the incidence of AIDS, yeah. but it has grown among this community Category. of people. Yeah. So wh how do you hope to destigmatize this yeah. aspect of uh, life? That's a very, very important question, and that's one of the areas uh, that we are looking at. I mentioned it at a conference we had in New York uh, yesterday. That is a conference on HIV AIDS. We have been successful in reducing the prevalence level of HIV AIDS generally within our country. It's gone from about 3.6% to 1.5% over the last 10 years. But we have hotspots, and these hotspots are commercial sex workers. We've been successful there too. We brought the uh, percentage prevalence rate from 80% to 25% today. But then now there is the category of men having sex with men. Uh, there's a very strong cultural hostility to homosexuality in our society. And so often people are not willing to own up to their sexual orientation. And so the, the, these people are normally underground. It's difficult to identify who they are. It's difficult to reach them with awareness. It's difficult to reach them with treatment. And so we are trying to educate people to understand that we need to remove stigma so that people can come out you know, of, of hiding and be able to say, yeah, this is my sexual orientation. These are the problems I have, so that you can reach them with the appropriate interventions that are necessary. For instance, we have no statistics as to how many people 
you know, and uh, men having sex with men. We don't, we don't have any statistics. So how do you um, educate them? Through the media, through television, how does the... The media is the most important. If you, the various surveys we've done in Ghana, if you ask people, how do you receive information on various things? I mean, anything, health, education, everything. The first thing they'll tell you maybe is radio, maybe followed by television. And then after that, interpersonal communications and all that. So media is absolutely, absolutely important. And if you look at the nature of our geography, some areas are quite remote. You can't send people there, but you can reach them by the radio waves. And so we do a lot of education using radio and then with television. And then we also have community health workers and others who know the community and are able to reach there either with motorcycles, with bicycles, or any other appropriate means of transportation here. Yeah. Yeah, you also have another advantage now, I think, uh, particularly during your time as a Minister of Communications, Ghana has really blossomed as a country with uh, high cell phone penetration. Yeah. So that gives you an, another tool, perhaps, to reach out. That's right. Um, at the time we started this whole telecom liberalization, I mean, I look back 10 years and um, it's breathtaking how far we've come. You know, nobody believed that we could truly liberalize the sector and attract the kind of investment that have gone into it. Mobile phone technology has exploded across Africa. I mean, people have taken to it. Like, I mean, remote villages where we thought, I mean, if you send this telecom, nobody's going to have the income to afford to even buy, you know, credit to recharge a mobile phone. I mean, you're surprised. You put a cell site today and tomorrow there are 200 subscribers in a, a little village, you know. And so the mobile phone has become a very important, you know, means of tools of tool of communication, and it is one of the platforms that we can use one to educate people, two to reach them with messages, you know, and three to generally improve the quality of their lives going forward. I I, I was surprised though that while you have a sixty percent penetration in cell phone. Uh, internet users is only about 1.2 million, according to the statistics. Yeah. So how do you explain this discrepancy between high cell phone and very low internet? Yeah, um, it's because um, initially the policy we had in respect of rolling out telecoms was at first just to give people, you know, connectivity by voice, and so that is where our focus was. And so we concentrated a lot of, you know, resources in building out the network and all that. And um, with internet, the major problem was that we did not have enough access. We use, I mean, outmoded dial-up modems and so on and so forth, which were slow and all that. It made it very difficult to uh, access the net because our, uh, uh, we, di we didn't have sufficient broadband, you know, access. Happily, that situation is changing. Um, we have all the telcos rolling out their own internet. Uh, we have uh, BlackBerry internet comes with their mobile phones today, and so you don't need to go buy a laptop or you know to have access. You have so, a little computer in your hand. Yes, and so yeah. it's beginning to expand rapidly too. Uh, we had just one submarine cable, Seven Ghana, which was the submarine cable, you know, controlled by uh, Vodafone. Today there are three more, four submarine cables, one by GLOW, one by MAIN, one, one by MTN, and one owned by Vodafone, providing fast speed broadband access. And it comes with your uh, telecom service. They just can put a little antenna on top of your house and you have high speed service. And so it's you know, increasing the penetration. And I'm sure that in the next five years, we will see you know, quite a huge jump in internet penetration in Ghana. In the light of what we have seen in the Arab Spring, and you have written very eloquently about the Arab Spring, um, technology played a very important role there. And how do you see as internet and cell phone expands in Africa, how do you see this affecting America, Africa's political, social life? Well, for Sub-Saharan Africa, I think that the, the changes that need to be made have happened already. We called it the African Renaissance. I mean, when African countries started turning around, 
you know, military dictatorships were becoming a thing of the past. Most countries held national conferences, wrote constitutions, and if you look in sub-Saharan Africa, the bulk of countries in sub-Saharan Africa are constitutional democracies. I mean, between 2010 and 2011, over a 12-month period, 24 sub-Saharan African countries went to elections successfully. Uh, there might be a few hiccups like Cote d'Ivoire and so on, but largely, I mean, these were successful elections. And so for sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of that revolution has taken place already. And so in the article, I said we should rather ask what effect sub-Saharan Africa has had on North Africa in terms of what's, what's happening. Um, I think that social networking tools have been important in providing people with knowledge and awareness. Today, you cannot eternally suppress a people and let them not know what is happening in other parts of the world, ex except it's North Korea or something, you know. Yeah. Otherwise, in other parts of the world where internet and uh, the media, you know, television and all that, you know, is, is available, people can see what's happening in other parts of the world. And so you can't continue to suppress them. I, one thing I always say is we should not overplay, you know, the role of, you know, internet and you know, ICT in all this. It also has been, you know, the long suppressed feeling of the people mm -hmm. to be able to live in dignity, you know. And so it's a combination, it's an interplay of the two, you know. I think it's the people's will to rise and live in dignity combined with an instrument they had to make, you know, communication easier. I think that's what that's caused. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I agree entirely. Uh, now, the issue of African Union um, African Union has been rather ineffective, if I may say, in the case of Libya, in the case of Cote d'Ivoire. So what lessons would you draw from these two episodes of uh, what the African Union should do to be more effective? Um, I think that the African Union is, is it's important and it's still an effective tool. It was a un union that brought us together formerly as OAU, to fight the liberation struggle from colonial rule. And it finished that mandate. And so it was decided to change its mandate and create the African Union. Now the African Union is more for peace, security, and integration of the African continent. That is its mandate. It has done well in creating the platform for African leaders to discuss issues of integration and all that. And so I think they've done fantastically there. Often with issues of security, we have the Peace and Security Council, you know, in the African Union that deals with issues of conflict on the subcontinent. And if you consider that um, Niger, you know, had a problem, it's been solved. Liberia had a problem, it's been solved. Sierra Leone had a problem, it's been solved. Guinea had a problem, it's been solved. Mauritania had a problem, it's been solved. I think that on the balance, if you want to assess the African Union, it has done positively. We cannot use just Cote d'Ivoire and Libya to, to judge that. With Cote d'Ivoire and Libya, I would say that it is also the role the international community played because the UN took an interest in what was happening. And as, as you know, a resolution was passed that allowed you know, um, air, air strikes you know, in Libya. And so while the African Union was playing a mediatory role, you know, air strikes had started to happen already. By the time the African Union team was ready to land in Tripoli, the airport had been closed, you know, so it took a while for them to be able to go there. They spoke to Gaddafi, Gaddafi agreed to a truce, but unfortunately the rebels said, no, we don't want any truce unless Gaddafi is out of the picture, you know, and so that has created its own difficulties. But I think that the Libyan people, I mean, they don't have to destroy their country before they come to peace. There should be some dialogue that goes on, you know. I think the period for airstrikes is relatively over. I mean, the threat to uh, the citizens is a bit more abated. And so we should look at the opportunity for them to dialogue and try and resolve the, the issue. Otherwise, if it continues like this, I mean, by the time you know, uh, peace returns, that country would have been completely obliterated. Yeah. Now, in Cote d'Ivoire, um, you, you are very, your president issued a statement and you also said that our policy is of peace, so you stayed out of uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Has that affected your relationship with uh, Ottara or? No, we have a fantastic relation with Cote d'Ivoire. Cote d'Ivoire is our neighbor, and so our destinies are tied to each other. 
Um, we would have wished that the issue was resolved more amicably and peacefully rather than uh, through the force of arms. Unfortunately, the resolution eventually came through you know, fighting. And so we think that Cote d'Ivoire has the opportunity to make a fresh start. And a lot will depend on the Ouattara government. You know, he needs to reach out and create a government of national unity and start a healing process in Cote d'Ivoire. Cote d'Ivoire's problems have an ethnic and a religious dimension. And I think that how President Ouattara handles it going forward is going to be important. Ghana, our president was at his inauguration and we pledged any support they wanted to help you know, Cote d'Ivoire you know, become the uh, nation that it was once again, living at peace with itself and uh, developing uh, the quality of lives of its people. And finally, globalization has been uh, very positive for Ghana overall. I think especially because given Ghana's natural resources, gold, cocoa, and now oil, it is, must be doing pretty well with this, in the given market of commodity prices rising. Now, as you have said yourself, that having this natural resources could also be a curse. So how do you hope to prevent Ghana becoming like another Nigeria with, uh, with a lot of resources, but a uh, lot of problem as well? How do you avoid that? We have been very lucky especially with the oil and gas industry uh, because of the timing at which we discovered you know, Ghana's uh, oil and gas potential. It's given us the opportunity to learn from the best experiences and from the worst experiences. And let me say on record that both experiences, I mean countries that have gone through both experiences have been very generous in sharing their experience with us. Countries like Norway, you know, which are some of the best practices in how to manage an oil and gas industry have been absolutely, absolutely fantastic in assisting Ghana to develop our legislation and so on and so forth. And countries like Nigeria, which have had, you know, not good, so good experiences with oil, have also been fantastic and generous in sharing their experience with us. We've had several Nigerian resource people come and talk at oil and gas conferences in Ghana and analyze, you know, what, you know, problems they went through and all that. And I don't, absolutely blame them. Nigeria had nobody to learn from. They discovered oil and gas in the 1960s. There were no other African countries or other developing countries that had, had this resource. And so they had to learn from their own experience and develop their own experience. You know, but I must say that they have made quite rapid progress. They have a strong local industry that services the oil and gas industry that we don't have in Ghana. You know, and so they're telling us, look at local content, look at local content, because you must increase the multiply effect of the industry in your economy. It's not enough to just get re, uh, the money from the oil sales and all that and develop huge infrastructure, but how you integrate the industry backwards into your economy is critical. And so that's one red flag they've raised for us. And so right at the beginning of the industry, we are passing a local content bill that forces the oil companies to look for expertise locally. So that's a good thing. But all in all, I mean, we do have a lot of natural resources, bauxite, manganese, you know, gold, you know, and uh, cocoa and so on and so forth. One of the things we want to avoid is the Dutch disease so that oil does not become like the dominant, you know, uh, sector of our economy and that we channel some of the oil resources into uh, keeping agriculture active, ensuring food security for Ghana and so on and so forth. So we've learned from those experiences. And, and you also have, I think, said that you are going to uh, adhere to the extractive um, in, uh, yes. industries. We've signed on to the Extractive Industries Transparency in C Initiative. Yeah. yeah, and Ghana is an active member. We do regular assessments to ensure that these things are being, uh, you know, uh, applied in, in a transparent manner and so on and so forth. We have regular review teams and so on. And so Ghana is committed to that and we will uphold it. One advantage Ghana has in all this is that we have a free society. People are free to criticize. We have a vibrant media that you know, is free to write anything it wants. And I think that those are the guarantees you need you know, to ensure transparency going forward. On that very positive note, Mr. Past President, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.